Welcome everyone to Talking Data. I'm your host, Kristen Radish with Arbor Research and Trading, joined today by our commentator, Jim Bianco of Bianco Research. Welcome, Jim. Thanks for having me. Today, Jim discusses the proper levels for yields. This week, the 30-year yield has been trading near 5%, and that has some people worried, Jim. What's a good rule of thumb of where yield should be? You know, that is the question of the week because you're hearing a lot of people talk about almost, you know, in hyperventilating tones, that 30 years at 5% as if there is something wrong with that level and that, you know, that something must be corrected. I would argue the answer is no, there isn't anything wrong with that. If so, if we go to the first chart, a good rule of thumb, as you asked, is where is the pro where should an interest rate in a country trade should it be at zero should it be at 100 percent? should it be at five what is the proper level look at the nominal growth of the country and that's what we see in this chart the orange line is the 10-year yield and the blue bars are the nominal uh, yield for uh, the united states now this tends to be a fairly good rule of thumb for where we should be now let me define some of this stuff for people, nominal growth, nominal GDP. That is real growth plus inflation. So the two together. As this chart shows over the last year, that's been about 4.7%. So when is it appropriate for a country to, to have 100% interest rates? If they have 100% nominal growth. Now, why would a country have 100% nominal growth? Because they have 100% inflation and no growth. Then that, you know, when would it be appropriate like Japan until about a year ago or a year and a half ago to be trading at zero? Because the combination of their real growth and inflation is zero, which is what Japan was. So as a rule of thumb, this generally follows, you know, where interest rates should be. Now you see that big dip and in, in spike around COVID, but that was kind of short lived. So what it shows is we had 4.28% 10 year yield at the end of the first quarter, and we were at 4.7% nominal growth. Now, nominal growth, this is backward looking, but the markets are forward looking. So if we go to the next chart, what the next chart shows us here is uh, on the top is the actual growth. So that's the blue bars from the previous chart in orange on the top. And now the blue bars on this are what's called expected nominal growth. And then the difference is, is in the bottom. What this is showing us is the Philadelphia Federal Reserve does a survey of professional forecasters, a couple of hundred of them. One of the questions they ask is, what do you think nominal growth will be in the next year? So instead of saying, what has it been actual, this is looking forward. So the bottom panel, by the way, I should mention that the actual growth rate was shifted back a year so that it lines up so you could see what the error rate is. And the error rate's very small. If you look at the, if you look at the bottom panel, it's, uh, you know, it's somewhere around um, uh, zero. So it's actually a fairly good number. And this is very similar to the backward looking number at 4.61%. So if we go to the third chart on this, uh, you know, now I, I, I switch it. So the, now the orange line on the top panel is the 10 year yield. And that's a forward looking measure because it's a market measure. And the, and the blue bars are the expected nominal growth in the next year. That's a forward looking measure too and they're fairly close to each other again around covid because of the machinations of covid it kind of got a little bit out of line but they've kind of lined themselves up um, fairly well and so the question is where should the 10-year note be trading the answer is around four and a half percent it is trading at around four and a half percent right now so for all the hand wringing about the the, the big beautiful bill is too much spending and we're too worried about inflation with their tariffs and there's something wrong with the bond market because it's got too high a yield. Actually, it doesn't. It might actually be at the proper yield. How do real rates work into this framework? So when you look at this chart, what you'll notice on the bottom panel on this chart real quick is that, you know, from the 80s to 2000s, you'll see a bunch of green bars. And from 2000 forward, you'll see a bunch of red bars. So there's like an inherent bias. From the 80s to the 2000s, interest rates trended in the same direction as nominal GDP, but traded above them. From 2000 forward, they trended in the same direction, 
but traded below them. So if we go to the next chart, the next chart here shows that, you know, in those green red bars are the same thing as the previous bottom panel, the difference between nominal GDP and interest rates. And so you can see that now what I overlaid on it is the 10 year real yield. So that is the 10 year yield minus inflation. So the real yield. So when real yields are big, you should expect that not only do we trade with nominal GDP, but with big real yields, we should trade a little bit above it. When real yields are low, like they were pre-2000, the opposite should occur. We should follow nominal GDP, but stay, but interest rates should stay a little bit below it. And what you'll notice in the last couple of years is real, real uh, interest rates or real yields on the 10-year have been moving up. The blue line has been moving up back to about positive point, uh, positive two percent. And those bars have gone from big red bars to, to basically nothing. Now, let me restate what we're looking at here. When you have big real yields, the market is putting in a cushion for risk. It sees that there's inflation. It sees that interest rates need to trade above inflation because there's a risk in the market. So it's nominal plus that risk and you trade them higher. When it's relieved that there isn't inflation, 2000 to 2020 or so, then those real yields disappear and then interest rates can trade below nominal. But nominal kind of sets the tone and real yields kind of refine this a little bit more. So where we should we be uh, in terms of nominal, nominal being around 4.6, when you put into the, into the equation, real yields are moving higher then we should be around 4.6. We shouldn't be around four, you know, trading a little bit below it. We're not high enough on real yields that you should say they should be above five. Um, if they're going to go above five, it's going to be because nominal growth is going to continue to expand. How can one track real rates? Yeah, so that's the good question. So if we go to the final chart on the, on the mix here, um, you know, the actual measure for real rates is the 10-year yield minus the one-year change in uh, inflation and that is the blue line on this chart it shows you over time but there's also the 10-year tip security the treasury inflation protected security that yield is the market's estimate of real yield now this is again the blue line is the actual so that's looking backwards what has the real yield been over the last year and the orange line is the market's estimate of what it thinks it's going to be in the near future say the next year or so into the future. They track each other fairly well. So the tips yield is a good one to use and the tips yield tells you where the market thinks. Now, what it's telling you is 2% is where they've actually been. That's the blue lines around 2%. And the and the tips yield is saying we should stay there around 2%. Now, why is that? There's two things we need to remember. If you look at that period between 2010 and I've said this on countless of these podcasts, from 2010 to 2022, we had zero interest rates, we had money printing, we had negative interest rates in Europe. That was the anomaly. That was the extreme. That was not normal. As I said in the podcast last week, the All In guys in their podcast two weeks ago and this past weekend spent 15, 20 minutes talking about what's wrong with the bond market. And they literally said again this weekend, that normal bond market in their mind, bunch of Silicon Valley gazillionaires, normal in their mind is zero on the funds rate, two on the 10-year yield. That's normal. No, that was the most extreme period we possibly have ever seen in the bond market, not to be repeated again. What we're seeing with real yields, trending part two, you could throw into, you know, term premium is moving higher. People talk about the term premium move up. It's kind of the same thing is that the market is saying we're returning to normal. That period from 2010 to 2022 is over. We're going back up. That's why you're following nominal growth. And on top of that, the real yield is moving higher. So you should be trading it at least nominal growth, if not slightly higher. Now, why is nominal returning? Because that risk is coming back. We've got inflation. Now, it's funny when I say we have inflation. And I'll use core as my metric. I'll say, we have, an, we have sticky inflation. People come back to me and say, but we're at a four-year low in inflation. Correct. We are at a four-year low in inflation for two things. Core CPI is at 2.8%. It's a four-year low. 
it is higher than any reading between 2010 and 2022. 2.8% between 2010 and 2022 would have freaked everybody out because it would have been a nosebleed high inflation. Today, it's a four-year low, and we're saying inflation's been south. No, if you want to return to zero and two, like the all-in guys are arguing, this is way too high of an inflation rate in order to say that we could take these real premium, real yield premiums out of the market, take the term premiums down, trade interest rates below nominal growth. So there, that is the first thing is that we should be up here because we've got this sticky inflation. The second thing is when it comes to real growth, there's a couple of things that are that are going to start happening. First, in in in, in inflation, you've got people expecting an inflation boost because of tariffs and the base effect. The base effect is May of last year, and I'll go with headline now because that's the one I got memorized. The headline was zero last year, May of last year. June of last year was zero on the headline. So if we're looking at the year over year calculation, we're gonna be dropping zero from it. Those are rare. And no one expects at least for the May and June numbers this year to be zero, like some number above that, and maybe even substantially above that because of the tariff induced inflation. So that year over year inflation number is gonna start going higher. The second thing that we're starting to see is that all of the talk of a recession is quickly dissipating. May 1st, use poly market, the um, online betting market, it's as good a metric as any, was 65% chance we were gonna have a recession this year. Right as we started to record today, I looked, it's down to 27%, and it should be. The economic data has been coming in since May 1st to say all that talk about empty shelves and recessions and soft data suggesting that everybody's gonna stop and there's gonna be a collapse in the economy. Look, I understood that argument. I was even arguing, remember I was arguing, 50-50 chance of recession, but I also said within 90 days, I'll either be at 85% chance of recession or 15, and I'm quickly moving myself back towards 15 because there's no evidence at this point that the economy is slowed. It's gonna stay strong. And with tariff-induced inflation and the base effect, that 4.6, 4.7% nominal number might push over five, and that should bring interest rates up with them. Well, what about the final thought is what about the big beautiful bill and all the spending and the extra 2.4 trillion dollars in the deficit it's going to add isn't that impacting the market and the answer is it will i don't think it is impacting the market at five percent 30 year 450 or 440 on the 10 year that's where we should be but if this bill passes remember it only passed the house still has to pass the senate They'll pass a different version. Then it's got to go to reconciliation, where they rewrite the whole thing from scratch so that it's identical bills. Then it has to pass the House and Senate again, and the president has to sign it. So we still don't know what the final form is going to be. We just know what the House passed. That's all we know um, at this point. But that can also be uh, you know, uh, something that could push interest rates higher. That's to come. It hasn't occurred yet. So that is a risk that's on top of the market. The final, final thought I would give you is if you look at the MOVE index, which stands for the Merrill Option Volatility Estimate, that's like the VIX of the bond market. It's it's the average implied um, uh, yield or uh, on 30-day uh, interest rate options from the two-year to the 30-year. It's below its average over the last couple of years. It's very calm. It's saying to you 450 or 440 on the 10 year, pushing 5% on the 30 year, normal. Nothing to get worked up about here. It's where things should be. So I think what I, the message here is when you look at nominal GDP and you look at real yields and stuff, this is where we should be. The risks out there, like the big beautiful bill, expanding the deficit, creating a bigger need to borrow, can push these rates even higher. It's too early for Bill Dudley, the former New York Federal Reserve chairman, writing op-eds in the Bloomberg earlier this week, hyperventilating that yields are up because they're all worried about this massive spending that's going to be coming on because of this bill. No, that's not what yields are where they should be. He's right. We should worry about that. That is still to come. So where are yields? 
They're at the levels they, they should be. We just need to get off of being like the all-in guys and thinking zero and two, zero funds rate, 2% tenure is normal. That was the most abnormal period. What we have now is normal. And we need to adjust our expectations and say, this is normal, get used to it. And when we do have problems like maybe too much spending and having extra borrowing because of the bill doesn't rein in that spending, rates could go substantially higher from this level. I'm not saying they will, I'm saying that's the risk. The risk is not that all the bad stuff is priced into the bond market and they've only got one way to go. I don't think it is. If rates are gonna go down, from here is substantially, we'd have to make the case that nominal GDP is going to go down. So that means either a slowdown in inflation, reverse the tariffs, or the economy starts to slow. But even through this morning's data, I still would argue the balance of the data is not suggesting any kind of slowdown in the economy. So this is where we are in rates, and the risk is that we could go higher. Jim, thank you for your thoughts today, and thank you everyone for joining us. If you have any questions on Arbor Research, Bianca Research, or Arbor Data Science, you can contact us by emailing Gus Handler at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. Thanks everyone, have a great day.